All right, so I'm going to start. And again, like I said, uh, you're going to have to forgive me for the first couple of minutes because I'll have to, to let people in. So I'll be switching between, uh, between my slides and Google Meet so I can let people in. Now, I haven't figured out how to, I don't know, there has to be a way of having like an overlay of Google, the Google Meet or something as you're presenting rather than alternating. I haven't found that yet. Uh, I wonder if there's a solution to that issue. Probably not, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, all right. <clears throat> I'm wondering if I should introduce myself here. Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> so my name is Lighton. For those of you that perhaps got an invitation from uh, a colleague and decided to join us, uh, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, so I'm currently a lecturer and researcher at the University of Zambia. Uh, I teach information science courses in the Department of Library and Information Science. But besides that, I, I also happen to be a part of uh, this informal group uh, that's referred to as the Data Lab Research Group. Um, and the title of my talk today is going to be Institutional Repository Single Sources of Truth. Uh, don't know if this is going to make sense to people once I'm done with this story, but um, so I, I decided to tell my story in such a way that things are going to somewhat make sense. Let me just see if people are in here. And I think they are. Okay. Great. Uh, so I thought I would talk a little bit more about the, this so-called data lab research group. It, it turns out that, uh, like I said, it's an informal group. It's mostly made up of students that I work with or students that I have been working with uh, since 2018, a few months after I joined. And this is mostly, a huge chunk of them actually undergraduate students because it turns out that uh, um, as part of, is it partial requirements for them to graduate, they need to do a so-called capstone project, so a final year project. And so they, they work in, in parts or in groups to, to, to perform some sort of undertaking uh, that's more aligned towards research, right? Uh, but I also have, uh, or I also work very closely with now uh, four master's students, right? And I think some of them are in the room right now. Um, but fundamentally, what we tend to focus on is really research that's more aligned to data mining, digital libraries, and uh, I guess what people now call technology-enhanced learning. Sometimes technology-enhanced learning is referred to as educational technology, essentially. Uh, when you do find time, if you go to that link, you'll find out uh, a little bit more about the data lab research group. Uh, although we are in the process of migrating the the website itself, so it might be a bit um, bit iffy here, maybe slow or something. So CICT is trying to help us with that. Um, you also find links to publications, especially capstone project reports that have been done by past students. So groups that I worked with last year and the year before that. Right. So so I thought I'd 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 sort of like structure my talk in such a way that I I start off by um, because. I was anticipating people uh, enrolled in the 5310 course, so I thought I would define a few concepts and a few definitions to help people understand what I'm going to talk about. And then uh, I'll try and provide some, some context and then I'll explicitly tell us what the problem is, what it is we've been trying to work towards, because it turns out that some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are things that uh, were undertaken way back in 2018, right? So the presentation today is part of a bigger picture that started in 2018. Um, and, and then I'll quickly run us through, I'll quickly run us through some past and current projects that are running, and then I'll focus more on what I've tagged as a data-driven ingestion of ETDs, which is really supposed to be the focus of this talk. And then I'll conclude and talk about some potential future directions that we are thinking about, right? Uh, I would like to think that there are probably very few people that understand what digital libraries are. But essentially what they are is they're just a specialized type of information management system, or rather a specialized type of digital library management system. And fundamentally what a digital libraries management system does really is it facilitates the long-term preservation of digital objects, right? Or digital content. So storage of digital objects, management of digital objects. And more importantly, it also facilitates um, access to the uh, digital objects, right? Um, and essentially, uh, or traditional institutional repositories have been used by institutions of higher learning to archive scholarly research output, right? So 
this, this slide essentially shows you a few screenshots from um, IRs or institutional repositories at the UNSA, right? So this is the institution-wide repository at the University of Zambia. And then at the background here, Open UCT is the institutional repository for the University of Cape Town. Um, and then in the foreground here is a, uh, a subject institutional repository, which we set up in 2018 as part of the Capstone project, right? So it's meant to act as a document archive for the Department of Library and Information Science. Right, so again, I mean, uh, whenever we, whenever I make mention of the word digital object here, I would like to remind us that I'm making reference to essentially an, an object that is composed of a local global unique identifier, right? So some sort of string that is used to uniquely identify it or set it apart from other objects. A bit stream, which is um, the actual content associated with the digital object and then metadata, which is uh, descriptive information about the bitstream. Sorry, this is what I was talking about. Uh, so, and I know the, the computer scientists in the room are probably thinking, well, but why do you, why do you have to say bitstream is, uh, uh, I mean, series of bits, but what about metadata itself? But I guess that's an issue to do with semantics here, right? Um, another way of thinking of the bitstream is the actual content that users will consume. So. In the case of institutional repositories, obviously, it's the PDF documents, right? Uh, PDF document that may be associated with a journal article, for instance, a conference paper, a technical report, a book chapter, a book, um, or perhaps an electronic thesis, and a electronic thesis or dissertation, um, as is the case of focus of attention for the talk, right? So I hope you remember this and keep this at the back of your mind, because it turns out that it's, it's actually the central focus of the talk. Um, Again, just to showcase to us what your typical digital object would look like, right? So the screenshot essentially shows you a digital object that corresponds to my doctoral thesis, right? Uh, what you see here, this piece of text is the descriptive information about this digital object, which is the metadata. Um, and then somewhere at the bottom of this page, if you go to this, this link, you'll find, uh, you'll find a hyperlink that takes you, or that allows you to download the actual bit string, which is a PDF document, a manuscript, right? Um, it turns out really though that whenever you talk about metadata uh, associated with digital objects, people who tend to misrepresent uh, that as being just tied to the descriptive information that you tend to see. And it turns out really that there's other types of metadata, right? So if you look up, you probably come across uh, terms like administrative metadata, for instance, right? So these are the behind the scenes uh, metadata that you typically associate with the digital object, right? Um, there's also metadata that is generally used to provide some sort of structure when the digital object is rendered. Um, uh, but yeah, so hopefully this kind of makes sense. All right. Um, so, but it turns out really that for, for you to get to this stage, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that is done, right? And um, this is usually done by uh, able staff uh, in libraries as has been traditionally the case. So they're the ones that will generally prepare metadata that is associated with the bitstream that you want to upload onto the IR, right? Um, and it turns out really that, that that whole process of preparing the metadata is time consuming, right? And, and re it requires that the people that are doing that are actually subject specialists in that particular field. Um, I'm not sure about the UNSA, but most of these uh, libraries, like I know the Investor of Cape Town does have uh, specialist subject librarians that uh, um, would normally prepare metadata associated with, let's say, ETDs coming from engineering, ETDs coming from the biological sciences, right? Because one of the things you have to do is identify appropriate subject tags or categories associated with a digital object. Um, and even worse still, the ingestion process of the digital object itself is, uh, it's a multi-step. It involves a, a workflow that is composed of a series of, uh, a series of steps. All right, so uh, UNSA, for instance, makes use of this space. And if you were to walk through the workflow, the ingestion workflow associated with this space, you'd be shocked, right? I think you go through a series of about five pages, right? Um, sorry, excuse me, I'm just letting Brian here. I hope people are following. Just feel free and uh, interrupt me if, if you need clarification or something. All right, and then finally, uh, still on definition and key concepts here, for those of you that are not very familiar with machine learning or this idea of uh, AI and whatnot, uh, 
the whole notion behind the tweet is that you can train an algorithm or an estimator, right, by feeding it data on how it should behave depending on what sort of data it's presented with, new data it's presented with. So what I have on this screenshot here is, um, is, is really just uh, an example, I guess, that most of us are familiar with spam detection in our mailbox. So if you use Gmail, I'm guessing you've, at one point or the other, you've actually had to go to your spam folder to tell Gmail to say, this is not spam, right? Um, at, at which point the email will actually be moved to your, to your inbox. What you're implicitly doing here is you're training the estimator behind the scenes to say, when you see something that looks similar to this email message, next time do not classify it as spam, right? So that's a classic example of the supervised machine learning um, technique. Uh, but these days really machine learning has become so mainstream that it's, it's literally all over the place, right? Mobile devices that we, we use, is, for, for instance, have some machine learning techniques uh, or some machine learning incorporated within them. If you're using Android, I don't know about these other platforms. All right, so hopefully that's uh, a good enough introduction on some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So in terms of context, right, I, I always like, when I'm talking about this, I always like to shock people or to remind them of things that they already know, right? Uh, that way they're able to better understand why it is we do what we do, right? In terms of the research that um, we found ourselves doing. Now, this uh, image that you're seeing, very depressing image, you agree with me, right? Uh, <laughs> You, you must remember, for those of you that are, in, uh, are studying at the University of Zambia, working at the University of Zambia, you must remember that as far as people are concerned, you come from an institution that ranks number 2, 2,229 on the world stage. Now, we can sit here and argue about whether or not this ranking is appropriate. It really doesn't matter whether you go to a different ranking other than Webometrics, the picture is still the same, right? It's dark, it's horrible, this needs to change, right? Um, I did invite some colleagues from Zikas and I was hoping they would see Zikas here, right? Number nine in Zambia, but number 18,706 on the world stage. But it turns out really that part of the reason why we are seeing this gloomy picture is tied to the fact that uh, the online visibility of research output for most of these institutions is quite low, right? And really, if you, if, you, if you spend a little bit more time to try and understand how these rankings arrive at, they'll be quite explicit, explicit right? So you notice that Webometrics has a statement there, right? Which says, uh, actually, I don't know if you can read this statement here, but if the web performance of an institution is below the expected position according to the academic excellence, uh, university authorities should reconsider their web policy, right? So, so essentially really is, it turns out that this online visibility of content that you produce as an institution impacts your ranking on the global stage, right? So forget the fact that you're number one in Zambia, right? Uh, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, you know, you're here. As far as Africa is concerned, you're number 48. Now, last time I did this presentation, I think we were number 60 or something. I guess we've improved. I don't know what we're doing right. but. Um, it turns out really that it, we, we've, we've actually been working with uh, other colleagues to try and understand uh, what's actually happening to this research that we generate. So be beginning last year, I was actually co-opted to be a part of a, a, a group uh, that's loosely termed as the Invest Ranking Committee for the Invest of Zambia. And so one of the things we have been doing is manually extracting content online, right, to try and understand the overall landscape of content that is generated at the University of Zambia. So what this uh, slide is showing you really is just a breakdown of the different publications that were, uh, I guess, published in 2018 by faculty staff and student, uh, students, I guess, at the University of Zambia, right? So a total of about 523 publications. Now, now granted, these are publications that are available online. So we used Google Scholar because turns out that Google Scholar actually indexes what's referred to as gray, gray literature. So we have um, some, some certain level of confidence to say uh, the content that we're extracting is really representative of the content that we expect to find online, right? If someone wants to come in here. Uh, okay, great. So, but it turns out really, is if, you, if you look at these 523 publications, uh, Last time I checked, we had about 858 faculty staff, 854, sorry, faculty staff, right? Um, we're still 
uh, if you look at the people that were, were actually publishing these articles, because it turns out some people are more prolific. So you can have a researcher publish, let's say 10 articles in a given year. It turns out that only about 55% uh, actually authored or co-authored these articles, right? And granted, some of these articles are actually authored by multiple people here. So the, the, the key takeaway point from this slide really is that there's very little content that is available online, content that's authored by faculty staff at the University of Zambia. Now, you, you're probably wondering here, sitting there and say, well, maybe we don't care about rankings, right? Uh, it turns out that the problem actually does persist beyond rankings, right? There's also this notion of uh, how impactful your research is really, right? Uh, and it turns out that that's heavily tied to your online presence as well. So what this screenshot is showing you again is, um, is really uh, the impact of uh, research published by faculty staff at the University of Zambia as of 2018. Now this impact here, the H index scores here, the breakdown of this H index, index scores is, is for the entire duration of these different faculty staff as of 2018, right? So it's different from from this picture, which only looks like a snapshot of publications in 2018, right? Now, I want to draw attention to H index score of zero here, right? 30% of faculty staff have an H index score of zero, meaning that 30% have not produced, at least this is what the picture tells us, right? They have not produced any sort of impactful research. In other words, really, one way of looking at this is that uh, it's difficult to tell how much impact their research has had because their research, at least the vast majority of them, their research is not available online. Like, uh, I, I, hope, I hope this helps contextualize things, right? Or I hope this helps to set the stage for the motivation for why we spent the last two years doing what we do, right? So the question is, what exactly is causing this problem? Well, it turns out really that um, what we've discovered is part of, part of the problem is that, um, part of the problem is that we, we don't really have deliberate policies that try to provide uh, incentives for faculty staff to make available their content online, right? Uh, now this, this picture here is somewhat uh, a bit different from what I just showed earlier because it's more tied to electronic theses and dissertations, right? But the story is the same here, right? What we've, we've noticed really in terms of electronic theses and dissertations is that there are fundamental flaws associated with the whole ingestion process of ETDs into the repository. Uh, and specifically, it's issues to do with the fact that um, there's usually a significant amount of time that passes between someone submitting a dissertation and that dissertation finding itself online. And in this case, the dissertation will find itself online when it's uploaded onto the UNSA institutional repository, right? Uh, I don't know if you can make sense of the, this bubble plot here, but it just shows you the, uh, the fact that one, one of the ways of reading this bubble plot here is that if you look at publications that were, let's say, published in 2014, for instance, you notice that there were some that were ingested into the repository in 2016. That's a problem, ideally here, what you want is a situation where when a student submits a dissertation to graduate, at least within a month of submission, that thing should find itself uh, onto the repository. Now, Zachary will tell, you, will tell you the problems associated with that. The fact that there are, there are very few people that are dedicated to do this. Last time we had this conversation with, with him, when he was uh, the IR manager, there were only two people that were responsible for ingesting content into the repository, not just ETDs, but all the content. So preprints associated with journal articles and conference papers and book chapters, right? This explains why there's this huge backlog, right? Or a huge time gap. But also, if you really look at the, the content in the repository, you'll notice that the metadata associated with this content is, is really, um, it's, it's, it's actually incorrectly tagged. So in some instances, there are, critical metadata elements that are missing. In certain instances, there are things that are incorrectly associated with these digital objects, right? Um, and so really, most of what we've been doing as a data lab research group is really trying to see how best we can address this problem or these challenges, right? Uh, and I, maybe you are sitting there asking, besides the ranking, why, why else are you doing this? Well, 
we have this grand plan, right? We, we're trying to mimic what the rest of the world is doing. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to uh, hear about so-called national ETG portals, right? So these are essentially integrated um, web applications or portals that will archive research output from various institutions around the country. So what we envision is a sort of situation where we have uh, some sort of national electronic thesis and dissertation portal where we shall have content coming in from all the, uh, last time I checked, I think it was yesterday, 60 universities in the Republic of Zambia, right? Now the screenshot is just showing you some prototype uh, application that we've set up. So if you go to this link, um, it's a bit unstable because it's sitting on an IFI server here, but you should have access to this uh, national ETG portal. Ideally, what we envision is a situation where we were able to have this content coming in from all the different universities. At the very least, content coming in from all the public universities. Now, again, uh, why we might want to do this is probably a story that might, might take quite a bit of time, but, but I'll, I'll give you some scenarios here. What are the chances that if you don't have access to things that are being done at Mungushi University, for instance, if you don't have access, easy access to the ETDs, what are the chances that a PhD student will be working on the same things that have already been done at Mungushi University? Chances are quite, or the odds are quite high, right? If I'm wanting to collaborate with someone from CBU and they, they don't publish their things uh, or they don't archive uh, things that they're producing onto the institutional repository, how am I going to find out what sort of work they're doing? It's hard, right? So hope this gives you an idea of why we are doing this. But also more importantly here, we should remember that uh, most of the research in Zambia, as is the case around the world, is funded by taxpayers. The least you should do is ensure that you, you ensure that these people that fund your research have easy access to the research that you're producing. Right? All right. Uh, so like I was saying, the, the grand plan here if you want to see all the 60 universities in, in Zambia, just go to the Higher Education Authority website, you'll be able to see them here. The grand plan is to have all these different universities, um, irrespective of whether they are teaching oriented universities or teaching and research universities, they have to put their content there. I mean, uh, we know some of them will tell us that they offer postgraduate courses, right? Master's programs, you want to see the, the output coming from, from those programs, right? All right. So it turns out that what we've discovered really is that, um, is, is that a, a multifaceted and multi-stakeholder approach is what really could potentially work, right, in helping us achieve this, this broad objective. Uh, there's usually this misconception that uh, all you have to do is just find an application and give it to people, right? It doesn't work, right? And those of you that have done any sort of information science course who appreciate the fact that it doesn't work, right? The first thing they'll teach you when you're uh, studying an information science course is, is that an, an information system, a computer-based information system is actually composed of those five key elements, right? Hardware, software, data sources, uh, procedures, people, communications infrastructure, right? And the people part here is, is what I think is really important, right? Not just the system. Uh, so what we've decided to do really uh, as a lab um, in conjunction with the people that we work with is to, to really try and exploit these different techniques um, and hopefully eventually we should be able to come up with uh, a solution that would work, right? So the initiatives that I'm going to quickly walk us through before I narrow down to this data-driven approach are, uh, are going to be multi multifaceted, you'll notice. Um, and I guess I'll start with this screenshot uh, sometime in, oh, time flies, it was towards the end of 2018. Zachary Abel and myself uh, organized this national workshop uh, where we invited people, uh, mostly individuals or experts working in high learning institutions um, to come through so that we can share ideas on, on this whole notion of open access publishing. And really part of what we focused on was how we could take advantage of uh, open source tools uh, to set up effective institutional repositories, right? So you could view that as being like, uh, I guess, tied to a multi-stakeholder approach, right? Where you involve all these different people that are important in trying to help us see things through. All right, uh, something else we, we have done, and I've done this uh, with Abel, this is still work in progress, is we've, um, we've been having talks with the Higher Education Authority to, to try and explain to them that um, 
they, they have a huge role to play in all of this because it turns out that when universities are registering with HEA, part of what they have to do is uh, meet a certain set of minimum requirements, right? Um, so it's still, still work in progress, but we, we feel we've gotten to a stage where HEA is beginning to understand the importance of open access nutritional repositories in Zambia, for instance. Uh, at the very least, we're able to actually convince them that it would be a lot easier for them to be able to generate reports based on what sort of output is coming in from those institutions of higher learning. Um, we've also been interacting with individual institutions. More recently, I think beginning uh, last, towards the end of last year, I don't know if it was early this year. Zachary should remind me here, I'm losing track of time because of COVID. But we, we started engaging with Zikas, right? Uh, and the plan really is to interact more with uh, other universities besides Zikas University, right? Again, a multi-stakeholder approach here. Right? So in terms of uh, this multifaceted approach here, I thought, before I go to the data-driven component of my talk, I'm just going to walk us through some past and current pro projects that we've been working towards. Again, centered around um, this grand problem that we're attempting to solve, right? Uh, 2018, I worked with a, a group of fourth years. Uh, one of the beauties of working as an academic is you get to rub shoulders with really smart students students that are normally highly driven, uh, irrespective of the motivation, whether it's because they want to graduate or not. But I worked with this group of students who uh, work towards trying to figure out or assess whether it would be feasible to set up so-called subject repositories. Um, and it turns out one of the most important outcomes from that particular study was that it was actually feasible. Uh, and in fact, we've set up a subject repository for the Department of Library and Information Science. And the idea behind that is to try and decentralize the whole, um, the whole ingestion process. So rather than have this institution-wide portal where you have uh, dedicated resources from the library and just content, you can have these smaller repositories where um, different people can ingest content and then later on uh, synchronize that content with the institution-wide repository. We know this works because it has been done elsewhere and actually we were able to showcase that it actually is able to work at the University of Zambia. This portal has been running for the last two years. So if you go there, you should be able to access content, content that's specific to the Department of Library Information Science, but content that's subsequently synchronized with the institution-wide uh, IR. Uh, if you're interested in the science part of what they did, uh, or the experimentation part, you're welcome to read the entire report. Uh, well, one of the key outcomes here is that if you look at the SAS score in terms of usability, um, it falls within the okay to good. And this is a good thing, I guess. Uh, and then last year, I worked with a group of students that were obsessed really in trying to, to really uh, figure out what sort of effect controlled vocabulary sets would have on an IR. <clears throat> anyway, key takeaway point here is you want to integrate your institutional repository with a controlled vocabulary set. Right, so if you're a person who is heavily involved with these IRs, which is the case for most students enrolled in 5310, you want to make sure that you seriously think about this. And we have more conversations coming our way because in module number five, I think, or is it six, we actually have a broad discussion of digital libraries. But I digress. Uh, so Angela uh, is a master's student who is working on a project that's centered around trying to figure out which sort of effective workflows can be taken advantage of to ensure that there's, um, there's really a uh, recency associated with content ingested into the repository, right? So remember that problem associated with huge time gaps. So um, the assumption she's making or the main tenet or the main idea behind our work is that uh, if we identify key stakeholders involved with this thing we're calling an ETD and we incorporate those key stakeholders we might be able to drastically reduce the turnaround time, right? Uh, I don't know if Angela is around here, but interesting work she's doing here. Um, and then this year, um, I'm working with a group of students that are going to be exploring ways in which we can integrate so-called ETDMS, which is a metadata schema, into the ingestion workflow. Because it turns out that if you have an institutional repository, right, that um, is used to store different types of objects, journal articles or journal preprints and postprints, conference papers and ETDs, 
you might have to pay particular attention to the way you're encoding the metadata. And ETDs are supposed to be encoded in a certain prescribed way. ETDMS is the uh, metadata standard advocated by the NDOTD, right? And the reason why I want to pay particular attention to this is because there are downstream services out there that automatically harvest this content from the repositories. So if you look up OATD, for instance, so the NDOTD union catalog, what you realize is that they automatically harvest content from repositories around the world. So you want to make sure that that content is properly uh, encoded with the correct ETDMS uh, scheme elements, right? Uh, I'm just gonna now just quickly walk you through some uh, data, a data-driven approach that we, we've been um, experimenting with for a couple of months now. Um, and this is the part that I guess the 57 students are going to, to really find interesting, although we've had a discussion about this previously. So our, our thinking is that to, to actually partially solve this whole problem associated with recency of content, Right, those problems that I, st I stated when I was talking about the, the main problem that we're trying to address here, and issues to do with uh, inconsistencies associated with metadata, we can take advantage of um, machine learning techniques. Um, and so what we have done is we've actually implemented um, a, a model that is able to classify ETDs, classify them in such a way that um, you cut down on the amount of work involved when you are wanting to ingest an ETD. So rather than have um, a staff, a member of staff from the library manually encode or prepare metadata associated with that ETD that they would want to ingest, rather than have them go through that painful, it is painful by the way, the painful process of uh, the submission workflow associated with this space, we can automate some of those things, right? Um, and the way that we've gone about automating this really is by making use of what we think is a single source of truth. Um, and the single source of truth here is the actual PDF document. We know that the PDF document has authentic information. So that manuscript, the dissertation or thesis that the student submits has the correct information that you would want to associate uh, or that you would want to, to, that you'd want to associate with the metadata of the digital object, right? Uh, and so the, the idea really is quite simple, right? So we, we do a lot of text mining from that particular ETD. Um, and then essentially because we are fundamentally working with text, what we do is we, we do the usual, right? If you, you've done any machine learning uh, course, you know that uh, the way that you work with text, in machine learning is you need to transform it into either, uh, I guess, a bag of words or the, the, the famous, uh, is it TF-IDF representation of the text? Of course, there are other web embedding techniques out there, but uh, what we mostly focused on really was a uh, bag of words and uh, TFID. So we're experimenting with those two different approaches to try and figure out um, what actually works best. Now, if you go to, this paper is still impressed, but if people are interested, I can share the current version of this paper. What you realize is that there are certain models, uh, and I think it should be the ETD, is it the collection or the type? I can't remember now. Um, that work best with the bag of words rather than the TFIDF representation, especially when you're dealing with titles, right? But the idea really is you, you pull out the text and then using the, the text representation of each ETD, we can automatically classify what type of ETD that is, the different subjects that should be associated with the ETD, and which collection in the repository that ETD should be ingested into. Now, think for a second here. Doing this would cut down the amount of work that is involved when the person in the library sits down and reads that document to encode the metadata. Because for the person in the library to figure out what sort of um, metadata they should associate to the ETD, one of the things they do is they open up the ETD, the document, they will read the title, they will read the abstract. Using the information they have read, they'll be able to deduce, because they're experts, they'll be able to deduce to say, the subjects that we should associate to this ETD are these particular subjects that are tied to, obviously, Library of Congress subject heading in this case, right? Um, so the thinking here is we can automatically do that with a machine, right? 
Uh, so this is fundamental idea of what we've done here. Um, again, the gory details of what was actually done, the experiments and, and everything else is in the paper. Um, happy to share the details of that uh, by sending you a link to the paper. Um, but the idea behind this really is uh, we went out there to the repository and then we automatically harvested, um, we automatically harvested the PDF documents uh, for each of these that are currently in the repository and the corresponding descriptive information, right? So some of the text features that we were interested in working with is obviously the content that you find on the, on the cover page, right? Because it turns out that if you look at the cover page, by, by just reading up on what's on the cover, cover page, you should be able to deduce things like, uh, I guess the collection where that ETD should go to, because part of the requirement from DRGS is somewhere at the bottom of the title page or cover page, you must indicate um, you must indicate the program name, right? This program name could easily be linked to which faculty you're from. Anyway, um, so of course, I mean, for those of you that are paying attention, one of the reasons why we got the metadata is we needed a basis or something we could use as labels, right? So the labels we got from the, um, the descriptive metadata. Although we've refined this further because we, we've actually manually tagged uh, all ETDs into the repository as of, I think, December, is it January? We, we had students, undergraduate students, help us with the transcription or coding of this information to make sure that we were actually working with the correct information. Um, and then something else we, we did from the single source of truth is we were able to use the um, metadata associated with the PDF document, right? So if you click uh, file and then properties on a PDF document, you should be able to see information like a creator, number of pages is what we're interested in. It turns out that the number of pages, the number of pages at UNSA will tell you whether something is a master's dissertation or a PhD thesis, because DRGS has a strict requirement. If you're writing, if you're writing a dissertation, a master's dissertation, the limit is I think 20,000 words. If it's a PhD, the limit is 40,000 words, right? So the way can easily be mapped onto number of pages, essentially. So really, the, again, the takeaway point here is that all these things I'm talking about were used as input to build these classification models, right? Um, again, if you're interested in the gory details, we just harvested the bit streams and the metadata using these two protocols. So the OIP MH protocol and the OAI ORE protocol. The OAI ORE protocol allows you to gain access to the actual PDF documents, the bit streams. OIPMH allows you to harvest the descriptive metadata, right? Um, now, I'm sure people are sitting there and say, well, but human beings are much more accurate than machines. That may be true, but machines are much faster. And we are quite happy with the, the results, really. If you look at the, the three classification models, you notice that, uh, I mean, the, ETD type classification is almost it's too good to be true here, right? Um, uh, the collection classification and subject classification, not so good. Uh, but the key takeaway point is we can take advantage of these results to come up with some sort of intervention that combines human and the machine. And really that's what we we are trying to work towards here, right? So we build this classification models, the next classification models, right? Um, of, uh, um, a Flask-based API. Uh, and the, the hope is that eventually we get to a stage where we implement some sort of uh, web-based interface that can be linked to the API and then later on integrate that web-based interface with the repository so that a person from the library logs on, um, they make use of this API, it automatically classifies the ETD, all they do is they verify that what the machine has done is actually true. If it's not true, they just make minor modifications rather than going through the manual painful process. Right, right so again, in conclusion, I guess because of the, uh, the confusion that was there here, I went slightly uh, beyond time here. Well, what we are, 
what we see ourselves doing here is uh, our immediate our immediate action point is to make sure that this thing is up and running, the national ETD portal, and we're really serious about this. Uh, hopefully, be, be, the, the target was that before the end of the year, we deploy this and convince the seven public higher education institutions in Zambia to actually interface with the, their repositories with the national ATD portal. So we want to see those other institutions other than CBU and UNSA to be on this list. Yeah. Um, and then of course, um, something else we are thinking of doing or that's in the pipeline is to see how best we can take advantage of deep learning approaches to automatically generate ETDMS metadata elements. We think this is possible. If you look up literature, there are people that are doing fancy things like um, automatically summarizing ETDs. If you can automatically summarize an ETD, like an entire dissertation, you should be able to pick out important metadata elements from the entire ETD. Um, um, and then something else, uh, as part of the bigger picture, something else um, the master's student is working towards, it's Robert, he's a master's student in the Department of Computer Science, uh, is he's, he's trying to take this whole thing a step further, excuse me, by, by trying to build models that will go beyond automatic classification of ETDs. So what he's trying to figure out is, can we automatically classify all those different types of objects, conference papers, journal articles, um, technical reports, book chapters and books. Right? Again, if you think about it really, um, if you just mimic what a human being does to classify whether something is a book or it's a journal article, if you can mimic that, you should be able to build the classification model. Still work in progress. Um, Robert was instead supposed to give a talk center around this, but he was unable to. Um, I just want to wrap up by reminding us that um, <laughs> uh, it's back, the, the dark image is back here. This is it, right? Um, whether you might want to do this to save face, whether you might want to do this because you want to be proud of where you come from, um, I guess is an entirely different conversation altogether, but what we are obsessing a lot about really as part of what I just talked about is to see how best we can increase the online footprint of tagged as UNSA, but we see what we are doing as being generic enough to be replicated by other institutions. Great, so I'm gonna uh, just pause for a little while and see if uh, people have questions. I do apologize for the quick up here. Um, you should be able to find more information um, about what it is we are doing if you access these different publications here. Uh, I don't know if people have questions. I'll go back to the dark 